I think being a bigot is an equal opportunity phenomenon. But in order to create a system or systemic institutionalized privilege, you have to have prejudice plus the power to institutionalize that prejudice, to put it into laws, to put it into actions, policies, procedures. I was actually just talking to my daughter the other day, the 12-year-old, about white privilege. And she said, well, what are, what's this research you're doing, Mom? And I said, well, it's on white privilege. Well, what is that? And it's like, okay, how am I going to explain this to this 12-year-old? And I have this student from, that was an old student of mine from Ripon, Leighton. Leighton used to take care of our house. And I said, okay, you know Leighton, right? I have to warn the neighbors that Leighton's taking care of the house so that when they see this large black man going to my house that he belongs there. I said, you don't have to explain to people when you walk up the street to take care of the friend's cat. That's white privilege. When young white people say, and it is a litany of things, um, they're making a mountain out of a molehill, they're exaggerating, they're hypersensitive, they make everything about race. All of those comments are about being able to have been in this white space for all your life and never have to think about how that was a racialized space so that when a person of color brings up racism to most white people, particularly young white people who have no sort of historical memory of race, let alone contemporary understanding, to them it's like, well, race wasn't in the room until you brought it up, right? Race was not a problem until the black person says it or the Latino says it or the Asian Pacific Islander or the indigenous person brings it up. Then race is in the room because they've, again, never had to think of their space as racialized space because they don't know the stories of their own parents. How did their parents get that house?